178, Brother Jim. just a little side note to tell you I heard the other day that if you complain that you take five minutes off your life every time you complain every time you complain people that complain don't live as long as people that do not complain so I'm not going to complain because I want to live forever <laughs> and one of these days when I get to heaven by the power of God I'm not going to, you know what people that complain they'll even find something wrong with heaven so I that's what yeah, you're right they won't be there will they they will not be there I'm ready to go verse 2 again glory forever I am in this place. I'm determined Jesus completely saves me from all in race well spirit I have
Praise the Lord. I don't believe it's going to be long. How about you? Get up 
fine walk with Jesus Ain't I gonna stay here in this valley one more day Hey, I cried you know I'm gonna move out and claim my victory Gonna get up, get up, get up Lean on Jesus all the way I'm gonna get up Get up and walk with Jesus Ain't I gonna stay here in this valley one more day yeah, I've cried enough I'm gonna move out and claim my victory Gonna get up, get up, get up Lean on Jesus all the way I've been down so long It seemed the sun would never shine My troubles clouded all my dreams And broke this heart of mine He has no power against me. He cannot shake my faith. No, I'm gonna get up. Get up and walk with Jesus. Ain't I gonna stay here in this valley one more day? Hey, I've cried enough. I'm gonna move high and claim my victory. Gonna get up, get up, get up. Lean on Jesus all the way. Jesus wants for me no matter what I go and do. He said he'd never leave me and his promise is there oh, true. Yeah. I will let my burden steal my joy That's and bring right. me down. I'll cast my cares upon him and you move in the highest world. I'm going to get up. Get up and walk with Jesus. Ain't I going to stay here? One more day. Hey, I've cried enough. I'm gonna move high and claim my victory. Gonna get up, get up, get up. Lean on Jesus all the way. Hey, I'm gonna get up. I'm gonna get up, get up, get up and walk with Jesus. Ain't gonna stay here in this valley one more day.
believe I believe somebody needs just worship the Lord for a few minutes. Anybody want to just worship the Lord for a few minutes? Glory to God. Amen, amen. Oh, it's great to be in the house of God this morning. Hey, uh, I'm excited about tonight. Hey, man, I believe Brother Corley has heard from God, and we're going to hear from the Lord tonight. I'm looking forward to hearing Brother Tim preach tonight, and then tonight's the first uh, youth service in the in the youth room for all our, our young people, our students, and, and I, I know they're excited about that. I, I'm looking forward to that, and, and, and I talked to Brother uh, Nathan uh, the, the last Sunday night in July. This or next month, we're going to have a water baptizing. Anybody wants to be baptized, you need to see me, and I told Brother Nathan I want him to baptize these students that night if they want to be baptized, and and I'll get the babies and the, and the kids and the adults. Thank you, Tim. I was waiting on that. But, <laughs> but anyway, exciting things are happening. Eddie James coming. I'm excited about that. I'll tell you. Praise God. Uh, mo most of you know 4th of July is coming up uh, Thursday. And, and uh, as I was praying and, and, and asking God to give me what he wanted to preach, and, and I ain't told Nathan yesterday, the Lord hadn't given me anything, so I'm just going to preach a typical 4th of July message, but then, as I sat down at my computer, was still praying, it felt like God gave me uh, something else, and, and uh, but still has to do with freedom. It's time that the children of God became free. It's time that the children of God get out of bondage of what the enemy had brought us into, and that we could be in freedom to worship the Lord. That's what I like about the Apostle Paul. Everything that he went through, he still had freedom of worship. Everything that he faced, he, he still uplifted the man called Jesus. And people knew who he was and that authority that he had because of that relationship that he had with the Lord. But anyway, the, I, I wanted to read something here. That, that I, I look back, I've got every message I've, I've preached here at Velvet Ridge the last 19 years, Brother Troy, and I look back and every 4th of July for the last 6, 7 years I've read this, but I love it. So I've just got to read it again. Uh, it, it said, only in America, only in America can a pizza get to your house faster than the ambulance. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Only in America there are handicapped parking Places in front of a skating rink. <laughs> Only in America do drugstores make the sick walk to the back, way back to the back of the store to get their prescriptions filled while the healthy people can buy cigarettes at the front of the store. <laughs> Only in America, I really love this one. Only in America do people order double cheeseburger, large fries, and a Diet Coke. Only in America do we leave cars worth thousands of dollars in the driveway and put the junk in the garage. <laughs> Only in America do we use answer machines to screen calls and have call waiting so we won't miss a call from somebody we didn't really want to talk to in the first place. <laughs> Only in America do we buy hot dogs in packages of tens and buns and the packages of eights. <laughs> <laughs> Only in America do we text, email, and Twitter but don't want to talk to nobody in person. Only in America do we use, word, use the word politics to describe the process so well. Poly in Latin means many, and ticks means blood-sucking creatures. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's our politics, isn't it? We got a many of them blood-sucking creatures. And the last one, only in America do banks Leave both doors open, then change the pins to the counters. I love America, don't you, church? The best place to live. I was at a, a, a at an event a while back, and they done the pledges, and I'm, I'm excited. I'm doing the pledges, and they started singing the the, uh, the song, and I'm there, boy, and some, some older teenager was texting through it all. So I just kind of leaned over, you know, when I was doing all of this, trying to look, see what he was texting. And it said something about this old man beside him. 
Since there's a woman on the other side, I assumed he was talking to me. So I had some of that Holy Ghost wisdom. I said, hey, buddy, you can leave. He said, what are you talking about leave? I said, if you don't like America, I'll buy you a plane ticket or a boat fare. But there's other countries you can move to, son. Amen. Probably should have told him about Jesus, Brother Pratt, but I was mad for that point. <laughs> you know, when you're mad, you don't tell folks about Jesus. Now, here's a sad part about America, written by George Carlin, entitled The Paradox of Our Times. It says, we spend more money, but we have less. We buy more, enjoy less. We have bigger houses, smaller families, more conveniences, but less time. We have more degrees, but less sense. More knowledge, but less judgment. More experts, yet more problems. More medicine, but less, less wellness. We drink too much, smoke too much, spend too much, laugh too little, drive too fast, get too angry, stay up too late, uh, get up too tired, read too little, watch TV too much, and pray too seldom. We have multiplied our possessions and reduced our value. We talk too much, love too seldom, hate too often. We learn how to make a living but not a life. We've added years to our life, not life to our years. We've been all the way to the moon and back and have trouble crossing the street to meet a new neighbor. We've done larger things, but yet not better things. We've cleaned up the air, but polluted our soul. We've uh, conquered the atom, but not a prejudice. We write more, but learn less. We plan more, accomplish less. We learn to rush, but not to wait. We build more computers to hold more information, produce more copies than ever, but we seldom communicate, and we do it less and less. But I'm going to still tell you, folks, I love America. She's the greatest place to live. And I, and I kind of praise this, too. I think Velvet Ridge, Arkansas, is even the best place to live at that. Amen? I love America. Yeah, give, give America a hand. I want you to turn, women, to St. John 8, beginning at verse 31. And like a lot of you, I was a little disappointed with our law givers and makers this, this last week. You know, uh, the law, in my opinion, marriages took a blow when, when they started recognizing same-sex marriages in, in some of our states. But, you know, as I prayed about that, and I know that there was preachers already tweeting and putting on Facebook that God would have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah uh, because of the shape that America's in. But I, I just want to remind you before I preach this morning that America is in bad shape. But yet America still has people that loves the Lord. In Solomon Gomorrah, they could not find one individual that loved the Lord, let on pray or talk to the Lord, not one. Even though there was sin in Solomon Gomorrah, such as we have in America, there's still people that will gather themselves in the house of God and will still worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So I, I don't want to compare ourselves with Solom and Glamorah. Amen. Amen? I don't want to compare myself to them. And, and even though the sin in, is in America is great, but all the children of God are still great. Prayers are still going up to the heavens from America. People are still holding on to the, to the strong arm of God, and God's still blessing. Amen? And so I, I, I just wanted to tell you up front that I'm disappointed in that degree, but I'm still proud to be American. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. John 8, beginning in verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word and are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendant and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you may, that, that you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most surely I say to you, whoever committed sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Can you say praise the Lord for God's word? Now, as Jesus is talking here, he's talking to some Jewish believers that are just new in the faith of God. They're weak in their faith at this point, and Jesus begins to tell them and teach them, if you continue in my word, you'll indeed be my disciples. He's trying to teach to them some, some, some righteousness here, some purity here, that, that God is in control, but they can be free. 
They didn't fully understand that because of being of the Old Testament, a belief and being of, of that of Abraham. They said, we've never been in bondage, but yet there's a many people that live for God that are still in bondage. There's a lot of people sitting right here in this church that is in bondage of one sense or another. Now, Jesus is saying right now you have a new faith, uh, but if you continue to hold on to the teachings uh, and keep on obeying them, that, that you will be one of my disciples, and being one of my disciples, that truth of the word of God, the truth of who I am, will set you free and will clearly keep you uh, in that state of freedom. Now, when we look at the 4th of July, it stands for freedom. It, it stands for living in a country that, that chose many, many years ago that we would live a life of, of, uh, of freedom. Uh, now, sometimes that freedom will get you in the bondage, amen? Sometimes that freedom will override your good common sense, uh, and that's not what Jesus is talking about here. But yet we in America have the freedom to go where we want to. You see, I've got the freedom today to, to go to eat anywhere I want to go eat at, and I choose to go eat where today. See, that's my freedom, not Sister Kelly's, but mine. We can go in there anywhere she wants to tomorrow. Amen. <laughs> But we have the freedom to go where we want to go. We have freedom to worship anywhere we want to worship or the freedom not to worship. We have freedom that we decide things ourselves. And as long as we can afford to do those things, we have the freedom of doing it. And so 4th of July, that freedom, it, it means the state of being free, uh, uh, politics, of uh, uh, independence, uh, personal liberty, exempt and frankness within our speech, a right as a citizen or a member, and the right to enjoy life and to fulfill the happiness that we want to do. Now, does that mean that we can do what we are pleased to do, or does it mean that we should do what God wants us to do? Does it mean that I can live free by the standards of my life uh, or, or the standards of this nation or world? Or does it mean free to live by God's standards uh, and God alone and his standards? Uh, does it mean free to fulfill my pleasures uh, or to cry out to God and seek God and let him give me his pleasures that I can fulfill those pleasures? Uh, now, now, to the close of a speech that the, the speech that was given to Congress by Franklin D. Roosevelt on January 6, 1941, uh, he gave them his vision that he wanted for America and for the war, uh, for the world after the Europe war was over. He spoke, spoke of four basic freedoms uh, which all people could enjoy in America and around the world. He said freedom of speech, uh, freedom of worship, freedom uh, uh, from want, uh, and freedom from fear. Uh, but yet then the World War II exploded uh, and went beyond uh, uh, Europe, uh, and this vision was never fulfilled uh, or never given in the proper means. Uh, but yet when he gave those four freedoms, he forgot about something, and that's the freedom from ourselves. Uh, you see, church, I'm not worried about somebody else putting me in bondage. Uh, I worry about putting myself in bondage. Amen? Amen. Now, Jesus was talking again to these new believers uh, about this new kind of a freedom, a spiritual freedom rather than a political freedom. And at that point, they didn't really understand what Jesus was talking about, but Jesus was telling them, when you live in my word uh, and you live in my world, uh, I can help you to be free. And he says, free indeed. Now, I really don't think, Brother Gary, those Christians at that time understood what Jesus was talking about because they didn't have the word of God that you and I have. We understand what he's talking about here, but I truly believe there's a lot of people in the church world that still don't get it. Now, we look at John 10 and 10 uh, where the devil or Jesus says that the devil comes uh, to steal, kill, and destroy. But he also said he may come and do that, but I've come to give you life, uh, and i come to give it to you in, in the abundance uh, to fulfill that life. Uh, and so what Jesus is saying here uh, is that the world can put you in bondage, 
but I can still put you in freedom. The world can take away from you, but I can still pour out in you. I, I love that testimony, Brother Robert, that you and Kendra are given unto God because Satan came in to steal, kill, and destroy. But you're living that verse out because Robert and Kendra is a testimony and even testifying about what God is giving them through the children of God and through the church and how the churches came into their lives to be a blessing no more than what they would do if it was somebody else. So what we're seeing here is that the bondage of this world, the bondage of finances, the bondage of our political government, the bondage of our health, the bondage that, that will come all around us, but Jesus says, I've come to give you life. I've come to give you freedom. I've come to give you the enjoyment and the pleasures of what I can do for you that you don't have to live in the bondage of the enemy and the enemy will not destroy you, neither your body, your soul, or mind because I've come to give you freedom. One writer said when Jesus set us free, it makes a greater impact upon our personal lives. You see, a lot of times we look at being free indeed to just come into the house of God. We look around at some of the other uh, 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 nations or countries uh, where they've got to meet in secret and private, but we've got a freedom to come here today. But yet the freedom is so much more than that that I can go on and do what God's called me to do because of the freedom and the liberty of Jesus and not the nation that I live in. Does, does that make sense what I'm trying to tell you? And so, church, uh, we, we cannot afford in these days uh, to let the enemy bring bondage to our lives. Uh, we, we can't afford in this day that we live in uh, it, to, to let the enemy uh, put his thumb upon us and, and press us to the point that we sit back and let this world run the rapid that she runs into uh, with, and run over us uh, to where we have no rights. Uh, now, one writer said, and I believe this, uh, that every religion in the world has rights except Christianity. Uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, they, they even voted in Tennessee, and, and I believe it passed, uh, that you cannot get up, preach against, speak against, uh, in any setting uh, of the Muslim faith. Uh, it's against the law now in Tennessee. So if I was preaching today and said something negative about the Muslim faith, uh, I could be put in jail. Now, what I'm trying to tell you, folks, uh, is I'm not worried uh, about the Muslim faith. Uh, I'm not worried about Buddha. I'm not worried about Mohammed. I'm only worried uh, about pleasing the King of kings and the Lord of lords today. I want a freedom within my relationship unto God today. And that's where we need to be as a church, uh, is that we would have freedom in the Lord, uh, that we would worship him in spirit and in truth. But yet we can be so dependent upon the Lord that he would count it an honor to use us for something for his glory. Now when we look at freedom, there's, all, there's only three things I want us to look at. First of all, we need to be free from the guilt of sin. Now let me say first of all, if you've got sin in your life, you need to be guilty. You need to feel the guilt. Amen? That's called conviction. Ever seen in your life, you need to know that there's a standard that, 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 that not the church of God, and there is a standard that the church of God goes by, but we need to live by the standard of God. I'm not worried about the standard of the church of God more than I am the standard of God's word, if that makes sense. But you see, church, if there's sin in your life, conviction, guiltiness is going to follow you. God wants you. He pursues you. He wants a relationship with you. And he will convict you and put guilt in your life uh, until you get on your knees and pray through uh, or until you finally turn away from God and God knows that you're not coming back to him. What I want to say is that we need that guiltiness or that conviction when we do things wrong. We need that guilt. But yet there's also another guilt, and that's that guilt that God or that the devil brings up of who we used to be. 
He brings up that guilt uh, of, of what I did yesterday that I've been forgiven over and washed by the blood of the Lamb. Uh, and therefore, I, I get that guilty sensation that I cannot live the life that God wants me to live. I get to that place uh, that, that I feel a cloud of condemnation uh, and I feel like that God cannot speak to me or use me because of the guilt of what I used to carry. But you see, the Word teaches us uh, that we are forgiven. The Word teaches us uh, that it's been th thrown out of, uh, of our lives and even out of heaven as far as it is from the east to the west. And so church, when we look at it on God's point of view, uh, then God's not worried about what we used to be, only what we are and what we're going to be for his glory. Now I read this story, Brother Dole, where this woman went to the pastor and said, God spoke to me, come to me in a vision. And the pastor said, no, God wouldn't do that. I, I, I'm the pastor. First of all, let me say, this ain't me and it's not you. I believe God can visit you just as much he can visit me. Amen. But in this scenario, the lady said, well, okay. And she went home and sure enough, that night she had another vision. She called the pastor up. The pastor said, no, God's not going to visit you like that, honey. I'm the pastor. He will visit me. And to prove to you, when the Lord does that again, so to speak, you ask him the sin that I committed when I was a young man, and let's just see what happens. And so sure enough, that next night, Mike, the, the Lord came in and visited with her in a vision, and she asked him the question. My pastor does not believe this, uh, and he wants me to ask you about that sin that he committed as a young man. And the Lord spoke unto her, and this is what she told her pastor. He don't remember. You get this? You get this? He doesn't remember. You see, God is not hung up on what you used to be. He's hung up on what you're going to be. Isn't that wonderful? He doesn't condemn me from yesterday. He lifts me up for today. He praises me that I can worship him and be a child of God. He's not worried about my failures of yesterday. He's not putting me down because of yesterday. He's not holding me back because of yesterday. And he's not withholding blessings from his children because of what we used to be. But church, we are the children of God. And when those guilty sensations start coming around, we just need to turn it over to the Lord and say, Lord, I gave you this years ago, but the, but the devil hasn't got it yet. He he hasn't figured it out yet, and so I just want to give it back to you again. And God can handle it, church. He can take care of it. We need to get over that guiltiness of what we used to be, and if we are guilty of something, we need to pray through and give it to the Lord and get forgiveness of it. The second thing is the consequences of our sin. Now, sin has a consequence. We, we need to know that. Much of the time we have to suffer a consequence and we can't go back and change that. That's why the, the, the guilty, the, 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 the guiltiness starts following in our lives uh, because we have to live our lives uh, a lot of times uh, by the things that we did yesterday. The things yesterday, it may dictate to you how you live today. It, it, you know, I, I've talked to uh, 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 several people, Christian people, uh, I, I can take you to their house today uh, and I'll tell you that their mind is not where it ought to be at, Brother Mike, because of the drugs that they were on uh, and the horrors of their lives of yesterday. I can take you to people that love God with all their heart, but they walk with a limp today because they was in a crash or wreck of some sort uh, when they was in a drunken state. Uh, I, I can take you to people that their homes have split up uh, because of adultery and unfaithfulness or other reason in the relationships. Uh, but now as they came to God, they want to mend all of that, but yet that hurt is still there from yesterday. You see, church, we can't get away from yesterday. It, it, it is always there. But what it can do is help us make the right choices today. It can help us to, lead, uh, to live a life today. It can help us to come to the place uh, that I know that God wants me to do something for his glory. And I can't change the fact of what I did yesterday. I can only live with the consequences of that. But you know something? God gives us the strength to do that. 
When you look at the Apostle Paul, he said, I was the chief sinner of all sinners. Uh, he knew what he used to be. He knew that he went out and killed the saints of God. He knew that he was there when Stephen was stoned and, and was maybe one of the instigators uh, of him being stoned. Uh, he was there trying to tear down the church, trying to tear it apart uh, and, and do away with it. Uh, and even when Jesus knocked him on his backside off that donkey, he, Jesus even said, why are you kicking against the bridge? here. Why are you coming up against me here? You, you, you're trying to tear down something in the name of the church. You get this? In the name of the church you're trying to stop something. You're trying to overcome something in the name of the church. But I'm trying to introduce to you the power and the glory and the anointing and this grace that will be different from the Old Testament law. And so church, when I, I look at this, and, I, and you, you can't look at Paul saying that, that he lived in yesterday because it would have destroyed him. Every time he went to a city, to a church, a temple, every time he went somewhere, Brother Don, people knew what he used to be. That's why he said, I tried to forget those things behind me and press forward to the prize and the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. I, I truly believe, Brother Cody, I, I can't fix yesterday, but Jesus can give me the grace and the strength that I can keep marching on and use my yesterday mistakes as a testimony to build up the kingdom of God instead of tear down the kingdom of God. As they say, thank God I'm not what I used to be. And if you knew me then, I believe there's a song about that. If you knew me then, you don't know me now. Amen? But you see, what a testimony for the glory of God. And even in Revelations, the Bible teaches us that we overcome the, the, the wells of the enemy by the testimonies of the church. By telling folks what, what God's done for us. By telling folks where God's brought, out, brought us out of. By telling folks it wasn't God's fault. The enemy brought this to my life. See what I'm saying here? And then we need to look at something else. We need a freedom. And I believe this is very important. We need, a, we need to have freedom to be all that God wants us to be. I, I read several years ago. That only, it was either, I think, 5 to 7% of all people in America will fully fulfill what they feel like their life's calling is. They, they will live their life to the fullest of that calling. Now, we got a lot of people in America that wants to live life to the fullest according to their standards. But very few people will fulfill the calling of God. That they're bound up by whatever reason it is. They're, they're, they're bound up by finances. They're, they're bound up by their past. They're, they're bound up by their education. They're bound up by, by different things of their lives. And, and therefore, they feel like they cannot fulfill this calling that God has put upon them. Now, church, every person in this building has got a calling of some sort or some kind. Everyone in this building, God's called you for something. It may be within the four walls of our sanctuary or our church world, or it may be out there doing something else. Uh, you know, uh, Justin, I've watched you work with these children on the baseball field. I believe that's a calling from God. I, I don't believe it has to be right here in the church, but God can use men and women in various states and very various places uh, to be used by God's glory. I, I, I've seen the white, you've seen God's glory, but I've also heard testimonies of the white's life and how he's presented himself at Cox Paving and how people has come to God and has went back to their churches or went back to places uh, where the devil's trying to pull them out of because of the life of the white Cox. Uh, what are you saying, Doug? I'm saying you got to call it. Too many times we're trying to look around, J.W., what I can do right here, and God's saying, I've got something for you to do out here. I've got something for you to do uh, over yonder or around this place or that way. But yet we let, we let our lives dictate our calling unto God. We feel like we cannot fulfill it. We feel like we're not qualified. We, we feel like we don't have the words. We, don't, we feel like we don't have whatever the devil may put into your mind that you can't do this. Uh, I, I remember, and I, I go ahead and say it, I remember Chris, uh, he used to say, no, that ain't my cup of tea. I can't do that. That's your calling. That's Tanya's calling. You leave me out of this. I'll stay over here. But now God's got him right in the middle of doing things. And, 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 and Luke, you couldn't be here Wednesday night. And, and, and uh, our students pastor couldn't be here Wednesday night and Chris talked to the students Wednesday did he do okay students 
Ah, but you couldn't get him to do that a couple of years ago. Why? Because he was afraid of the calling God put upon his life. You get, and y'all can laugh all you want, but most of you are scared to do the true calling that God's given you. You feel like you can't do it. And what we've done is we shut out God and we've let America run a rapid pace that America does what it wants to. But if the children of God would get together, if God's children could bind themselves together and do the will of God and the work of God, we can change America. I, I, I read that during our last presidential vote or campaign or, or, or anyway, you're going through the polls and voting, uh, that only 47% of Christian people voted that day. Now, church, I, I, I know everybody in this building, 18 and up, voted. I got one amen. If you didn't, I hope you're guilty. I hope you feel the guilt of it. And you go vote this next, this next term. We need to vote. Because we can make a difference. Can you imagine 47% of the Christian population, I believe it was 47, Rick. I think you and I even talked about it. What, isn't that right, 47%? All right, in the mid-40s. And so voted. Now, if 100% Sister Sherry of the Christian population voted, we can change America. We really can but we've let the devil put a fixation in our minds uh, that we can't do anything. That, that we're the children of God. That we've got to roll over and play dead let everybody walk on us uh, and thinking that we cannot make a difference. The church, we can make a difference. We can do what God's called us to do. And we've served a great big God uh, and he knows that not everybody can get up behind a pulpit and preach the word. He knows that everybody cannot stand behind a podium and teach the word uh, or, or sing or do whatever. But everyone in this building has been called by God to do something and we don't need to let the, let the devil rob us of the work that the Father has given us. Uh, we need to get above the guilt and the shame uh, and and come to the place uh, that we can experience life to the fullness and to the abundance of the freedom that God wants us to have. Uh, you, you take a bird uh, that doesn't belong in the water and stick him under water for, long, for a long period of time, he ain't going to be happy. You take a fish out of the water, throw him on dry ground, uh, it won't take long for us. He's not going to be happy. And sometimes the church world uh, has got an anger issue, uh, and we have an anger problem sometimes uh, because we're not fulfilling what God has called us to do. We've let the devil talk us out of it, and we've accepted the pathway that America's going in and the church world is going in, and God is saying, that's not the direction that I want to go in, and he's calling somebody to come together that we can obey the call of God. Church, it's time that we came together in the freedom of the Lord, that we can worship him in the freedom of who he is, and we like that part, but it's time to work also for the glory of God and do what God wants us to do and start making a difference in America. It's time to get out of bondage. It's time to wake up, so to speak, and let us realize that Jesus said you can be free. And so my question this morning, in bringing this to a conclusion, if the musicians would come, do you have freedom? Even in the midst of your hurt, your bondage, and everything going wrong, is there freedom in your life? Fourth of July is coming up. Represents the freedom of our nation. The soldiers. And before you start playing, the, the soldiers that paid the price for our freedom, I, I want you to stand, all our veterans, if you would. I want you to and, and remain standing. Look around, church. Look at these men and women. Just give them a hand. Amen. Amen. You, you may be seated. I, I want to be the first one to say I appreciate you. I love you for the the price that you paid for our nation. I, I thank God for you. But folks, Jesus paid a price also. He paid a price that I can be free. I, I don't have to be bound up by habits. I, I don't have to be bound up by, by the problems of this world. I, I don't have to be bound up by the finances 
Somebody said, how do you get, get unbound from finance and start paying for what you've got? Amen? You know, there's a difference in paying for what you're getting and got than this putting out that credit card every time. Get out of bed. It takes a while, but you can do it. You can do it. How many knows what I'm talking about? You can do it. Get out of there. Pay the price. Jesus paid the price. Brother Robert, you and Kendra could, and, and I hope you don't find a perfect examples that could be beat down, depressed, and let the devil put a thumb and push you down by saying, hey, I just paid my home off. Just paid it off. Now all of a sudden it burns, total loss. But oh, look what God's done for me. You see, they're not letting the devil push them down. Because everything that Satan takes away from us, God gives it back to us, and he gives it back to us, and he gives it back to us. In case you don't know it, he gives it back to us. Over and over and over. Robert said he already got enough stuff to completely furnish a house. He just needs a house. So if you've got extra ones laying around somewhere, let us know. <laughs> And you know, that sounds foolish, but I talked to a guy the other day, Brother Tim, he said, you know, I own 22 homes. I said, man, 22 homes? And he said, yeah, they're all in White County. Man, if you've lost your man, you can't live in 22 houses. That's why he's got 21 of them rented out. <laughs> There's people who got homes laying around. We just need one, don't we, Robert? Praise God. Boy, if God gives Robert a home, everybody's in this church face would jump up a, a degree or two, wouldn't it? But he's already got more furniture than he had. God bless him. He's already got more clothes than he had. Praise God. Did you tell the story of your Bible? I, had, I was stepped up. We gave, I gave Robert and Kendra a, a, a new Bible. Let's, let me share this with you. In case you forgot, years ago we voted in a business meeting not to receive an offering but give the council the authority to take care of. And we're taking care of Robert and Kendra financially on some things. They don't know that yet, but they'll get a check after church. What this church body voted to do. So they'll get, they'll get some money. You, you keep blessing them. You keep taking care of them. But I took Robert back and so said, let me give you this Bible. Their family Bible that was sitting on their air conditioner beside the plug-in where the fire started. Not only did it not burn up, Sister Sadie, but it, it got no smoke smell or anything on it. Perfect. Isn't that just like God? What are you saying, preach? I'm saying freedom. Freedom from discouragement. Freedom from habits. Freedom from your past. Freedom for your future. Freedom to do the will of God. And we can. I want you to stand with me. I just feel like doing this a little bit different this morning. We're going to definitely.